there's there's always a lot of almost happens on the boats. That's something that I learned that uh, you learn your best uh, uh, information from the close calls. Welcome back to Everyone Has a Story, no true tales from everyday life. You know, we're so glad you're here. This story is about a gentleman who had seafaring men on both sides of his family who trained him early on how to be a ship's captain. He learned how to and handle a boat in all occasions, and he learned responsibility uh, early on. And I can tell you so much more about this gentleman, Captain Jay Wick. But... Why don't you just grab a cuppa and sit back and let Jay tell you his own story. Friends, this is Captain Jay Wick. Yeah, my grandfather uh, was a deckhand on log towing boats, and my dad was one of the youngest uh, captains on the Columbia River. Uh, my uncle... Uh, my dad's brother was also a, a captain on towboats, uh, both here and in Alaska, and then became a Columbia River ship pilot. Uh, my brother was also uh, a captain. My mom's brother was a captain and then later on became the uh, fireboat captain for the city of Portland. And he would fill in still on towboats, but that was his background and stuff. And in fact, one of the things that I, I have discovered, or at least from uh, the stories that I get from other parts of my family going up, my cousins uh, refer to the last towboat, uh, steamboat towboat race that was run on the Columbia River happened in 1952 when they were filming a movie with James Stewart called Bend in the River. And my dad's brother was the captain on the Portland and my mom's brother was the captain on the Henderson, the two steamboats, the paddle wheel boats that ran that race. When I officially went to work uh, the first day, it was on a towboat. I was 18 years old and it was the day after my 18th birthday. And that's what I grew up around was towboats and small tugboats. Uh, it wasn't until years later I went to passenger boats, and then I worked uh, a government boat and some research boats, and and uh, so I've been on various different uh, boats. It was actually on the Willamette River, and it was my first official day's pay. It was a very small towboat that we were positioning the center span for the Fremont Bridge to be moved into place and lifted up, and so. We moved that boat into position that the next day they were going to raise it up. And it became at the time, as I understand, the heaviest and longest uh, single vertical lift of that that's been accomplished. So I felt kind of uh, it was a good break in to get a chance to start the industry with something that was historic. Mostly lost and mad at my brother. My brother was actually the captain on the boat, and I think that he expected me to just be able to to look at him and know every thought that he had. And so when I wasn't in every position he wanted, he let me know, and I felt like for some reason I, I just was a step behind on everything. It was a, a big learning curve and a switch from all the days that I'd spent on the boats prior to that, because prior to that, my dad had kept me in the wheelhouse. So I, I knew everything that he was doing and nothing that the deckhands were doing. And that became apparent when I went out there. I was very fortunate that uh, the next two towboats that I worked on were both friends of the family that were captains uh, on that. And they taught me a lot. And my dad was my, my greatest teacher for, for boats from day one. He had a, a style and a, and a way about him that allowed me to actually grasp with the, the meaning and, and what we were doing. But I was fortunate that the two gentlemen, uh, Jim Morrell and, and Pete Beckin, uh, they took a lot of time and really taught me the right way and, and the right way to be a deckhand and, and to be in the industry and, and, it was just a, a continuation of learning that I got from an early age where my dad had 
spent his time trying to teach me about safety and, and basic operation and the importance of, you know, when you go on a boat and you're working for somebody, well, there's a gentleman out there someplace that owns that boat and he's providing you with a, a service and a way to make an income and move ahead. And so my dad had really instilled on me that you want to always be uh, early to, to your job and your places that on time is really late because so many people are based off the boat and, and minutes are or expenditures for them and so the important thing was that you know he instilled on me it's better for them to uh to be in position and and me be waiting on them than them to ever have to wait on me because at the end of the day if the boat has uh, arrived late there could be absolutely a, a huge number of people that are being affected and everybody's sitting and waiting for you and so he instilled on me it's better to be 15 early than to ever be a minute late and so that was my first going in and then with with jim and pete they taught me the concepts of communication back to them that we became a team in unison and, and as jim put it i was an extension of him out there and so always always think of it that way that everything you do is relating back to him and and he would take care of the safety aspects of things and watch over everything so i was learning even as i was decking that that safety was an aspect that both sides are looking back and double checking each other but the overview from the captain's seat is a little better vantage point and it just allowed me to to progress and learn there's there's always a lot of almost happens on the boats that's something that i learned that uh, you learn your best uh, uh information from the close calls but i did have a situation with a retired captain that came out and i was filling in for just a day and as it worked out we took off the barge and we're heading down through the bridges of portland and the engine quit and it, 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 we had no power, no anything, and we're coming down on the bridges with loaded barges. And I, of course, just, I, I looked at it and thought, well, you know, we're in a lot of trouble. And the captain that was on there taught me a really valuable lesson. Um, I don't even know if he was trying to, but it was something that stuck with me really well all the way through my entire career, is he taught me that day that if you stay focused, stay engaged, that even if everything went wrong and it was the worst scenario, you've made it better because you're trying all the time to correct the situation and do the best with it that you can. And so instead of hitting a dock or something, you know, maybe you, you know, caught a line and, you know, maybe it was one piling or a line that you put under, under strain rather than the whole toe because you didn't quit. You stayed with it to the very last inch and, and that was important. And in this case, he had me actually go out and loosen the BB winches, one and then the other, and tighten them and steered the boat by what he was having me do by creating a different angle to the rudder on the boat, on the positioning of the boat. And we went through all of those bridges without ever hitting one, uh, without having any control, just with the current and what he had me doing and what he was overseeing uh, just from the position of the boat by how much he cocked an angle can tighten up one side and loosen the other and created a different angle on the rudder back and forth until we got down close enough and then he had me out and and cast a line around the piling and then burn the line down to bring the barges to a stop without breaking the piling or the line and he taught me and walked me through uh even though i had seen it done it was still early enough in my career i kept thinking oh if i tighten this too much it's line parts and here we are out of drift again and you know he just kind of stayed in touch he actually walked out and and talked me through the tying down as it was and it was just a a tremendously educational experience on you know not giving up looking at what you can do to correct the situation always staying in the minute and and not getting sidetracked and also just not getting carried away with um, what you can't do accomplish what you can we'll be back to the story in just a minute we just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being here. And if you haven't subscribed yet, we'd appreciate you subscribing and, and to uh, give us a thumbs up and ring that notification bell so you'll know when that next great story is going to come out on Everyone Has a Story, True Tales from Everyday Life. Back to the story. Uh, 
I had multiple trips to Alaska in my life. The first one was truly my first true working in the wheelhouse and, and being on board as uh, the mate and working the back half and, and that. And it was going to Prudhoe Bay, 1985. And unfortunately, it was just right after my dad had passed away. And, and that and, um, I went ahead and, and made the trip up there. Uh, there was a lot of things that made it challenging, but it was a tremendous experience from my standpoint. Anything that I could learn or that was new was always, it seemed to be what I was craving. I always wanted more information. Once I left the uh, Willamette and Columbia Rivers, every every time I went someplace, it just increased my desire to want to learn something else. And uh, it was just the way I wanted to be. I I, I continuously went, and, and I think the Alaska experience probably motivated a lot when you're seeing you know thousands of geese and ducks and every time you look up at something different and a herd of caribou that's you know ten thousand or better in number and and even having to shut the boat down because there's narwhal out there and and i'm thinking to myself i never even knew there were narwhal let alone to get a chance to see them and and then i figured out that this is a very unique experience and and you know everything about what i did uh uh, help me to grow and want to experience more and want more knowledge. As a master, you're always in command and you never give up the command of the vessel. Um, you know, unless you're signed off on the log and you leave as a master of a vessel. And I was reminded uh, of this very, very much in my face on a situation I wasn't expecting. But as the master, you know, you are the ultimate insurer. And so you are criminally and civilly responsible for the vessel. And you're accountable for all your actions and that that happened. And how that came to being is I was working and loaned to another company uh, as my boat was in dry dock and being worked on. And the the boat was being leased from an owner and he wanted the boat back. And it ended up in a court case in Anchorage, Alaska. And so I had asked the, the owner if I could come up and witness this. So they got me a train ticket and I went from Seward to Anchorage and witnessed this court case on the ownership of the vessel. And the discussion came up at the time that uh, the owner felt that we were operating the vessel with the turbocharger uh, outside of safe limits and that it needed repair. And so we were damaging the vessel. And the, the attorneys and the owner and the, the leasee were all arguing and I was sitting back and all of a sudden the judge just stopped the whole proceedings and said, is the master of the vessel currently here? And of course, everybody looked at me and I stood up and the judge asked me to please step forward. And she said, at this point in time, would you take the, the boat out? What is your opinion? And reminded me that I would be criminally and civilly responsible for something if somebody was injured or the vessel was lost. And I said, considering the information I have at hand now, I would suggest that we bring in a third party, an engineer, to do an evaluation. And, and then by what he says, we determine if the, the turbo is good or not and go from there. And the judge looked around at everybody and said, that's why the only person that matters here is the master of the vessel, because they're the ones that are accountable for it. And he, she decided that that's what we should do is bring in an engineer, evaluate and go forward from there. And it really put it into perspective to me as sitting back completely out of the situation. I thought I all of a sudden became, you know, involved in the final determination. We had a, a vessel, it was the Queen of the West, uh, and when I got on the boat, the office side of things, the uh, vice president, that they had changed the steering on the vessel. And as we were going down the river that night, the vessel stuck hard over, and so we went out of the channel and, and ran aground. And with that, the, the gangway even came back through the, the front window. And, you know, I, I, I get woke up to all of this stuff currently happening. And I thought, OK, first thing I need to do is an evaluation safety of everybody involved. So I had people checking to see if there was any structural damage, any underwater damage, anything that, you know, put anybody in a danger situation. We did determined that there was no overall damage except for that front showroom. And then my next thing is I notified the Coast Guard. 
And the Coast Guard told me that I had to wait there. They would have an officer down to investigate and inspect the vessel. And I knew we were sitting in the channel and not in a good thing uh, situation. And with the weather and that, it wasn't a comfortable situation. And so I told the Coast Guard that I would meet them at the next port of call and that, you know, we would transit down. In the meantime, they said to stand by that the captain of the port would contact me. And I saw and, and knew there was a tugboat coming down with the captain I had worked with and contacted him and asked if he would just ride along next to us because when you have a malfunction, you never know when it's going to repeat. It's there and, and you know, you can't assume it's corrected just because you get it back in place. And so he agreed to run off our starboard side the rest of the way to the port of call running light boat down for a job he was doing. So I knew I had mitigated the situation uh, to tell the Coast Guard, which is something the Coast Guard will advise you of things, but if they ever take control of things, it just never ends. All of a sudden, you're you're just running and, and not doing what you're comfortable with, and you are the on-site leader. You're the one that knows all of the information, and so you need to, to stay in command of your vessel. And so when the captain of the port called back and said that I needed to stay there, I said, well, when you guys arrive, then you can sign the logbook that you accept full responsibility for the vessel financially and everything. And they said, well, we can't do that. And I said, then I'll see you at the next port of call because that's what I determine is the safest in this situation. And they agreed with me and said that I handled it well and by mitigating and getting the vessel alongside, they felt that I had taken the necessary means to move forward and go with that. And it just reinforced to me that you always have to stay in command and tell them what you're doing, that if, if you give that up, you're still going to be responsible and liable and not in control. And that's never a place anybody wants to be. We hope you enjoyed this story as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. We bring stories like Captain Jay Wick's uh, story about being a seafaring captain uh, on a regular basis. We hope you tune in for the next one coming soon. Until then, we'd appreciate that you would uh, give us a thumbs up and hit the notification bell. And, and if you haven't yet done it, subscribe so we can keep you apprised of what's going on. And everyone has a story. True tales from everyday life. Thanks. We'll see you next time.